Cuckoo darlings. So it is Saturday and <laughs> I'm trying not to feel overwhelmed, but today I'm playing triage out in the garden. I've got my overalls on. I'll show you what's going on, but it's just, there's some good things. There's some bad things. I walked the property after getting home last night. I was like, some stuff has happened while I was gone. So I'll show you what I'm dealing with today. And you know, just, sorry for the wind. Bottom line, it's just like one of those things where it's like, the Loire trip was all about work. Like some filming days with driving was like nine, 10 hours, worked every day, come back here. And it's hard not to feel overwhelmed, you know, with not just, you know, the pile of laundry and all the stuff I have to load. And then of course, everything that I have to do after doing all that filming, right? But the gardens as well and everything that's going on here. But <laughs> it will get done. It will get done. It is what it is. So we're just gonna take a break from the desk and the computer and what's going on inside the house. And I'll show you what's going on outside. We'll take a silver lining seriously is that it's beautiful i mean we've got gorgeous weather and i'm very lucky for that so um let's get let's get started i will try and film this again this afternoon but this is one of the bigger gifts that i came back to this wisteria has been a struggle bus the last couple of years i wasn't here to trim it um and winter prune it last year because of the renovation and the year before that it didn't bloom at all and i know because of the glare of the sun it's hard to see but there is just nothing but blooms i am so happy this thing is going to be a cascade of purple in just a few days um some maybe in a week's time i'm so excited and the other is the iris are starting to bloom so i'm really glad i didn't miss that show either Challenge number one was this. <laughs> Shipping things in France can be a problem. I had ordered these roses like, I don't know how many weeks in advance before I left and they were delivered Thursday. So not yesterday, but the day before. And I don't know how long they've been in that box in total. So I've been soaking them overnight in water. I don't know if they're gonna make it, honestly. So we're just, I'm just gonna have to see, but I have to contact the company to figure out, cause that's just, it's, I think they've been in transit for over two weeks now. It's crazy. Problem number two is this. My neighbor promised me he would come and water my Cosmos while I was gone and you saw them before I left and this is what's left. I don't even know why they look like this. It's, I, I think I'm just gonna have to literally order everything and start all over again. So that's sad. I also have a ton of dahlias to put into the ground over the next few days. So there's that. And then the drama continues with this it's even worse now i'll show you the back side of it if you didn't catch on to this contractor story i think it's in week two of my vlog and there's chapters on youtube so you can catch up with this drama but this is going to be an outdoor kitchen big terrace um overlooking my pasture and real quick this is firewood and stuff left over from the big storm that happened in november which is what caused this problem but look at the back of this now guys it actually is ripping off the wood frame now like the whole frame is starting to come off and fall so i don't know i asked denny if they can just come by and take off the roof now. So at least that part, I just, I don't know. I want a new garage here. This is an old building, but the problem is that you don't have the right to do that here in France. You have to submit anything exterior, even windows and doors, you have to submit to the mairie for approval. So this is not a quick fix by any means. It depends upon your knowledge of farming practices in France. Some people I think 
um, have a misconception that they don't use chemicals and pesticides. That is not the case here. Um, there certainly are organic farmers, but many farmers here in France use uh, chemicals. And one of them is Roundup, a very strong grade of Roundup. And one of the farmers near here was using Roundup and it somehow, while I was gone, drifted onto my property, it was sprayed near my rose gardens. And so some of my roses are dying from it. And I confirmed it with the David Austin group last night. And so um, I'm gonna try <laughs> and save them. I'll show you what it looks like. So this is what glyphosate round roundup damage looks like. And it is on my Judy Dench, David Austin's. So it's just like this, it came through and yeah, I don't know. And then the final challenge, let's say, hope it's the last challenge of the day is I left my riding lawnmower with Denny and he was supposed to bring it back to me this morning. I didn't get any news all morning long and he finally told me that a belt broke on it. He was trying to fix it. So the problem with that is I, that's the only way I have to mow the grass area in my yard and there's a lot of clover and dandelions growing right now and pearl is extremely like life-threatening, aller allergic to bees. And so like I have to carry an EpiPen with me whenever I go on walks in the spring and summer with her in the early autumn. Um, she's almost died twice from bee stings. So, yay, <laughs> yay Sunday, yay Saturday, yay weekend. Um, I will sign off now with just, I guess, you know, these are the challenges of everyday living, right? And these are just the challenges of life. And I think that the best way of going about doing it is first and foremost, taking care of yourself, you know, water, sleep, eat healthy, exercise, and the rest of it will work itself out at some point. So speaking of, I'm gonna take the girls for a walk. <laughs> This is still going to be here when I get back from that. So time for a walk and decompress, listen to the birds. I hope you have a wonderful weekend and I will see you tomorrow. Okay. I had to come back on here because the drama continues. So many of you know that I have a farmer neighbor who's on my property and helps me out with big projects. And like I mentioned earlier, the farmers around here will use Roundup. So he was doing me a favor while I was gone and <clears throat> sprayed the gravel driveway um, to get all the weeds out of it. And he went up into my rose garden and sprayed Roundup directly on the base of my roses. Uh, about a third of my collection up there. So, there you have it. That's what happened. Bye. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say to that. I seriously don't have anything else to say to that. I don't know what else to say. I don't have anything else to say to that. <laughs> but he just, he just messaged me and confirmed that he did that. Coucou darlings, bon dimanche. You are here in my dining room and you can see part of my gallery wall. And I'm sharing this with you today because I received a great question that I'm going to answer. I received this question while I was in the Loire Valley. How do you find the brocantes and the vide greniers that I go to? 
so the antique flea markets. And so I'm gonna share with you step-by-step step what the difference is, what to bring to them, how to find them, and all that kind of fun stuff. So I also am going to add a little bit of a response in regards to the Rose Garden situation. I've received a lot of feedback on that, so I'll add that at the end of today's video. So I hope you enjoy. I wish you a wonderful Sunday, and let's get started. So what's the difference between a brocante and a V Grenier? We will talk about that. I will share some tips on things to bring, as well as a list. Now, my house here in France is full of antiques that I have picked myself um, that date all the way back to the 17th century. Most of them come from Vide Greniers. I bring a list with me as well. There's a theme to this particular house and an interior designer <laughs> graciously themed the property Beau Paysage, beautiful countryside. And I've really dug into that. I, as an American, I didn't move halfway around the world to have a modern house. I've had the pleasure of doing that in the States as well as other architecture styles. And so by going to these V Greniers, I can affordably and easily find some very unique pieces that I just absolutely love. And I love the story with them too. V Greniers are such an experience. Um, and I often write on the back of each piece what, you know, what time of the year I found them, what year and the location, because it, each little thing is its own precious memory. The difference between a brocante and Vie Grenier. Let's talk about brocantes first. They are a permanent like, location, an actual store run by a professional operator. These tend to be a bit more expensive, a variety of operating hours, they're less willing to haggle on price sometimes. They may be thematic, as an example, mid-century modern specifically. They do not offer restrooms or food, but they're indoors and could be good for rainy day weather activities. And brocantes may offer shipping services. Meanwhile, V Greniers, which literally means empty attic, are usually Sunday only. So if you cannot go antiquing on a Sunday in France, a brocante might be a good option for you. They're often in a public space. The bigger ones have food and toilet options. Brocantes may not be dog friendly, but the outdoor V Greniers are a great option if you have a dog with you. V Greniers are a mix of private and professional. Think of it like a big community garage sale. Haggling is expected, so yes, you can do that. And while some Vie Greniers, I'll show you in just a minute, can be thematic, there's usually a huge mix of items, even handmade products like cards, jams, and plants. And again, Vie Greniers tend to be outdoors, so consider that if the weather is not going to be good. As a side note, there are also Vie Maisons. Those are like private whole house sales when somebody's getting ready to move. What to bring? Sunscreen is great for these outside bead greniers. You don't want to get a sunburn while you're enjoying all the antiques. Bottled water and cash, absolutely cash. Or if you live in France, a French checkbook. Usually only the brocantes accept credit cards and not always. Cash is king at these. And some bags to carry away all of your new treasures. And finally, Let's go online. I'm going to share with you a website and a couple applications for you to be able to quickly and easily find a brocante or V Grenier, no matter where you are at in France. Today, I am sharing with you a website that will help you find the V Greniers. Vigrenier.org is the website, vide-grenier.org. You can see it also at the top of this application. I'm using my iPad for this video. When you first open the application, you have one, two, three different options. And there is some advertising within this application. It's not too bad though. The first one that you'll want to choose is research. And that then leads you to the next page where you have even more options. You can search by city or town, around you, regions and departments, and a couple other options. But what I want to share with you is by city. That then brings you to this little bar at the top where you can put in maybe the town or village or city that you're going to be staying in. I'm going to put in because I was just down in the Loire Valley, Amboise. 
And then it's going to take you back to the screen that gives you the option, how close do you want to be to this? How far away are you willing to drive? I'm gonna bump this up to, let's say 40 kilometers and hit research. From there, it's going to give you a list separated by date. So today, Sunday the 14th, all of these V Greniers are happening nearby Amboise within 40 kilometers. Notice as I scroll up, the option to look at it by a map opens up in the upper right hand corner. You can continue to scroll down to the date that you are going to be in that area, but just know that a lot of these get populated pretty close to the date that they're happening. So check back if you're not finding the dates that you want. One more note. Down here at the bottom, if you click to the right area arrow, it will continue to move out dates a little bit farther in advance for you. Now, underneath each location, Dame de Marie Le Bois is a village, tour. <laughs> All these are different locations of the Vie Greniers happening today. There's a brief description of what they're about. Vie Grenier annual. So it's a, this is an annual one. Down here below, you can see that there is the first Vigrenier at this St. Joseph School. And here, a big sale of books and CDs and other media type, or Vigrenier for gardens. So know that not every Vigrenier is the same. When you click into this, you're gonna be given additional information. The date, again, the location, the hours. So it's starting at 6 a.m. If there's a price to enter, this one is free. The maximum number of vendors. This is important because I tend to look for where a maximum number is at least 150. I want to go to a big big grenier with lots of options. This one might be a little small for me. They're also going to share additional information like if there's a bouvet or which is like a food cart or food trucks, any sort of food on site. This uh, contact information is for people who want to put up tables there. And then sometimes right down here, there's also a poster. I like to look for that as well. Marketing and posters for the V Greniers means that they're done professionally, they're organized, and they likely are also going to have a mix of private and professional vendors. The one I want to share with you though is this one. This caught my eye. This is the 28th time this brocante has been happening at V. Grenier in Shansu, and I'm going to click on that. Now, as I go down again, you can see that it's actually being held at the school in the center of town. The hours for it today are from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It's free to enter, but look at this, 450 <laughs> vendors maximum. Now, this isn't the number actually there. That's the maximum number. But oh my goodness, this is going to be a big one. And on top of it, they have a dedicated website to it. So you know, this is a good one to go to. You've got additional information, but look at this. There's our poster. As I click on it, it's going to open up. And here it is, 28th Brocante and V. Grenier. So you've got a mix of professional and private, who it's organized by, the date. You even have a QR code and a website for it. And then you have down below, you can, it's sort of cut off by the V Grenier logo, but you can see that there's a bouvet and restoration means that you, there's food there as well. This would be very high on my list. So this is how I often find V Greniers when I'm traveling or even just nearby my home in France. In this demonstration, I'm going to share with you how to find a brocante. This is just my tip and my tactic, and I'm using Google Maps. For this demonstration. I have navigated back to Amboise for this because we were using Amboise earlier as an example. Now once I have navigated to the location that I'm interested in, I'm going to hit back and you can see here that now it gives me the option to search in that specific area and I'm going to type in brocante. And there we have it. There are a list of brocantes in the Amboise area. And if I zoom out, I can see a lot more. It just depends upon how far you want to drive. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the reviews on some of these. Perhaps they have a lot of reviews like this one, 146, and it's almost five full stars. That's a good one. 
ones that have uh, less stars or perhaps the photos don't intrigue me as much are also a good sign. For me, I'm looking for a nice mix of not <laughs> a hoarding type brocant where it's really difficult to dig through, but also not too much stylized. Like as an example, when I click on this one and I go into the photos, I can see that looks pretty, right? There's lots of nice things in this brocant, but it's almost a little bit too stylized for me. What that's going to mean is that this brocant and the person who owns it might be a little bit more expensive than the others that you have to dig through to find the treasures. Let's go back to the one that we just saw that had a lot of excellent reviews. 146. We click on that. You can read the actual reviews, but I also like looking at the photos. Do you see what I'm talking about here? It's not overly stylized. It looks like I might be digging through, as it says, treasures in Amboise. I might find some good finds here. It's not too hoardy, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not like I'm digging through junk, but I still have the opportunity to find some good treasures in here at an affordable price. That is my favorite way of being able to find a brocon. Now, let's look at the information that they have. It looks like they have a Facebook uh, website, so I would check that to see if they have any updates. This is what Google Maps is showing as their hours. But you know what? If you have the language skills, always call ahead. Uh, these guys tend to often keep very different hours. They will change things up a lot. So it's always just I highly recommend, cannot recommend enough. If this is something that you want to do, call ahead and make sure that they're going to be open. Okay. So that is how I find my brocants when I'm traveling and moving throughout France. Finally, one of the things that I love about Big Grenier's and Brocants is knowing that a piece is getting loved again and it's not ending up in the landfill. So reduce, reuse, and enjoy the hunt of a Vie de Grenier and Brocant in France. I hope you found this helpful and I will see you tomorrow. Look at it. <laughs> Isn't this ridiculous? Ridiculous. I'm so excited. It's a little overcast today, so hopefully you could see a bit better how many wisteria flowers are growing all the way across the front of my house. So excited. I also brought you up here so we can see a healthy rose. Look at how shiny and pretty she is. Going straight up, climbing into my wisteria as I wanted. So she flowers. After these blooms fade, the rose starts to bloom. Isn't that fun? So I just wanted to say thank you so much for your feedback in regards to the situation um, with my neighbors spraying my roses with Roundup. Um, if you missed that yesterday and the story has expired on Instagram, then you can I'll be posting this as I do every week, um, the full story, the full week on YouTube. So um, there is not much to share other than that. I received news from the David Austin grower here in Brittany in France. Uh, she's from the UK and she specializes in David Austin. She's a David Austin certified grower. And she contacted me after I shared the story. And she said that bottom line, I just need to wait. I need to wait and see what's going to happen to them. I need to wait and see um, if they're going to survive. But because he sprayed at the base, because he sprayed at the base, she thinks that um, they're likely not going to survive the chemicals. And uh, because of the strength of the, the roundup that the farmers use here in France, she also expects it to last about six months and possibly even go down as far as the roots are. So there's nothing to be done this year. Bottom line, I just need to wait and see if they survive it. I'm going to have to wait until next spring to plant new roses in its place. So, you know, and I, I appreciate a lot of your advice, truly. Um, but my perspective, I don't like to be reactionary and I don't like to come from a place of negativity. 
that's the news for now. I don't really think it's going to change much, but I will let you know if the roses, if any of them survive. So I hope you have a beautiful Sunday. I'm going to take the girls for a walk and I will see you tomorrow. darlings how are you today happy Monday so today I have so much work um, <laughs> it is like super blustery and not a very pretty day out here and I have been sharing a lot of longer videos so today in today's video it's gonna be a little bit brief but I wanted to introduce you to a French life hack here that I found out when I first moved to, to France it is a company that has been in business since the late 1800s and still owned by the same family. And it makes an amazing gift. You can get it anywhere in France. It costs less than two euros. It fits in the palm of your hand, weighs absolutely nothing, and it lasts for a long time. On top of all of that, uh, it makes your house and your clothes smell wonderful. I'm sure you want to know about this magical thing. Well, let me introduce you to it right now. We are here in my kitchen. I had to show this to you. Look how cute that is. It's like a little egg with a tiny feather stuck on it. Uh, it's the little things that are fun. Uh, this is the product. Do you see how it fits in my palm of my hand? Some of you may be familiar with this. It's about this thick, weighs absolutely nothing. And this company, Papier de Armigny, has been in the Paris region and in business since 1885, the same family. And so what happened, there's a little story on the inside, but Auguste Ponceau in 1885, he traveled to Armin, uh, Armigny and he uh, found this product. It's a uh, resin and it's called Benjamin in uh, informal terms, but it's benzoin. It's a resin from a tree. And he figured out how to get this resin into the paper. So what this is, is it is a paper that you burn and it is has the most lovely scent. They use this resin also in uh, incense at Catholic churches. So for me, this also is very a very comforting smell. So you find this in the pharmacies in France, um, right there up by the cash register. And it's usually around a buck 80 for all of these, okay? So this can last a long time depending upon how frequently you burn it. What you do is it's perforated. Do you see that? So there's three strips to a page. Now, you can do all three at once, like me, because you like the scent to be strong, or you can simply rip off a page here. This also is great in like your uh, luggage or your closet. It will just gently scent your clothes. And it's also great to travel with because it literally <laughs> takes up no room. And you can have some incense in your space. Like let's say you cook some fish or you want your house to smell really fresh before guests come over. This is absolutely perfect for this. You can buy a bunch of them and give them away as gifts because again, it is from Paris, it's from France, and the company has been in existence since 1885. So how do you burn it? Well, you can see here that the resin actually leaves uh, a product behind. So you want to choose something that is safe to burn in, but also that <laughs> It's, it's going to leave a mark afterwards. This is what the paper looks like when it is done burning. And so what you do, whether you have a couple of pieces or just one, you kind of just, <laughs> however you wanna do it, kind of fold it accordion style like this, okay? Doesn't have to be perfect. What the goal is, is that you want it to stand up on its side Otherwise, it might smolder and um, go out. This is a rechargeable lighter that I purchased off of Amazon. 
and you just simply light it on the ed on the edge, the short edge here. And you could see, I mean, ideally you don't, if it starts to actually flame, uh, you can blow it out, but that's it. <laughs> you just kind of set it on its side like this and it smells absolutely heavenly. There are other scents like rose, um, but the traditional one is my favorite. It, it smells like the inside of a Catholic church and I just love it so much. Um, they say in here and claim that it was also used to help with asthma and um, other uh, ailments. I do have seasonal winter asthma and it does not bother me whatsoever. So I burn this almost every morning after my coffee. It just makes me happy and I thought it might make you happy. So uh, this was my afternoon project after doing some work and video editing. I dug the holes deep enough. You see, it sort of blends in right now. That's how tall this tree is. Look, it's almost, there's the top of it right there. And there's the top of the windowsill. I really hope it makes it because they are super straight and tall. And you can see that I positioned this where it's up against the wall, right? And so this is going to come over and cascade over here, cascade over this way. The douchers are gonna keep climbing straight up. And then the other one is on this end. And the same effect. I sent you a photo of these and you really like them. They are just, they're a tree that kind of cascades these brilliant, bright, kind of pink red, I would say more pink because I don't like red. And so I positioned this guy to kind of cascade over in this direction. Darlings, I have a fun program for us today. It's going to take us outside. I've got before and after pictures. I have all the details. If you love gardening, you're gonna love what I have to share with you today. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that I haven't been posting every single day for you the last couple days, and that's gonna be the new norm. Things come and go, and I am crazy busy with work. I have to renew my visa. There's too much on my plate to edit videos for you, as much as I love you, every single day. So. Uh, that is going to be the new norm. Still going to post lots of fun things throughout the week as much as I can, but it's going to be more of like the really fun stuff and not every day, okay? And weekly vlogs are going up on YouTube every Friday. Let's go outside. So if you can believe it, about a year ago, this space was still all completely under construction. I'm going to share in just a moment a uh, before. <laughs> of what this looked like at the time of when I purchased this property. But this is what we're working on today. Let me share with you right now the plan. You can find this for free online. This is a Better Homes and Garden uh, plan. And so what you're gonna Google search is Better Homes and Garden, tough as nails perennial garden. I wanted something that I could plant, leave in, and be a bit drought tolerant. So. I will also share with you the exact plants that I chose. For those of you who are a bit new around here, uh, you may not be familiar with what this project is, so I'll explain that again. I'll share with you the before and after of this area and explain to you the strategy and the thought process behind the evolution of this part of my gardens. I have my friend Matthew here today to help me put all this into the ground because this is a big project and I want these plants to be in the ground and growing as soon as possible. But let me show you what this land looked like when I purchased it back in uh, 2020. So I am roughly in the same area as when the real estate photo was taken for the listing at the time I, that I purchased the property. You'll notice that this is all new. This is an extension that I built. And so this was all under construction uh, about a year ago. At the time of purchase, of course, the extension was not here. You can see that in the photo, this area 
was under plantings and I'll explain to you why I removed those. And then there was a building here and I tore that down to then open up and expose the view, the territorial view. We got Matthew's car here, my car right here, but hopefully that gives you a better idea as to what this looked like when I purchased the property. So the previous owner incorrectly put in some plants that actually had some deep root system in there and you can't do that when you have a foss, which is a septic tank beneath that. It can, um, it can hurt the foss system and the septic tank itself. And as I promised, this is called Bosch. This is a tarping product that keeps weeds. I mean, Brittany is extremely temperate year round and weeds are a huge problem. The purpose of this perennial garden is to kind of set and forget to a certain extent. And, um, and when I have large planting areas like this, I use Bosch to keep the weeds down. And so that's where all of these plants are going to be. As you saw, it used to be a building. And we removed the foundation, except for this part, because there's a water tap. Let me show you. Short here, I've got a tap, and the pipes go underneath this old foundation. And I've been advised not to dig up this section of the concrete. What to do is have somebody come in and do a stamped concrete terrace on top of this because again there's a major foot traffic and this is how I access the stables. Once we have that concrete level brought up then I can change out that door. At the same time I'm bringing in a stamped concrete walkway up to this extension because it completely opens up. They're just giant sliders with a step up into it. Once that's <laughs> that is done, then I can finally get some nice uh, gravel brought in and, and fill it in on either side. All right, so here is everything inventoried and finally laid out with respect to the design as well as the shape of the berm. All right, here we have it. I'll turn this around so you can see, but I'd wait until the sun started getting a little bit lower in the sky when we finished. It was still up so high. It took us about five hours to do this project. And then I, of course, had to mow my lawn and strimmer and clean up and do other things. But for those of you who don't know, the sun actually stays up <laughs> higher and it doesn't set, uh, at least compared to the States, until later. Like right now, it is setting around a little after nine. And back in the States, in the Portland, Oregon area, it's setting around eight. So there's just like, it, it's actually up, a, we're up just a hair higher. I think we're actually closer to the same uh, level as like Vancouver, BC here. And like during summer solstice, the, the longest day of the year, it won't set until like 11, 11.30 at night. <laughs> but that's like the, when it's like pitch dark, it's after midnight. So you can hear all the birds, it's so fun, but let me show you briefly what I did here. So the roses that Gerard gave me as a gift is, we planted these right here. Otherwise, this is all pretty much to plan. I put the, the Russian sage pretty much in the middle because it's going to be the tallest. At a meter and a half, it won't block the view. A lot of the lavender is on this side because I want to be able to smell it from the extension right here. Um, it's just going to perfume the whole entire living space. And my douche rose is right there. What's missing from this project is uh, about a dozen lavender on this side. So that's why I'm leaving that space blank, but we got them in. Rose is happy, they're all happy, they've all been watered. And there you have it. There is a life I lead in this city.
city Hurrying to cut my teeth I can take what I need to get by It doesn't make it easy The other piece of my heart moves slow Somewhere in the great unknown When I return from the afterglow Will you carry me like I am whole again? Wait, hold on Put me together Take me back where I belong I want it all I had a feeling but the feeling is all gone Wait, hold on Put me together Take me back where I belong I want it all all gone oddly cold, uh, down to the upper 30s again um, at night and just in the low 50s. So I, I get to run the wood stove again, super fun. Um, I wanted to expand on a question that I got about, is it necessary to have a car outside of the big cities in France? Um, and this person said, especially with a dog, I really started thinking about this because I flippantly said yes in my experience, but there's just so much more to that story and why I said that. Oddly enough, I feel like my response is actually tied to something bigger. Uh, my experience and the reason why I said that is tied to sort of this false uh, story of what it's like to live in France fed to me in my experience through um, American media, like it's film culture, just all of the, the media that we receive over there. I had in my mind these falsehoods about how I could live in this country. And I had some pretty big learning curves when I first moved here. And so it absolutely ties into this question and my subsequent answers. So let's take the girls for a walk and I will explain. First, I wanted to say thank you so much for your wonderful comments and support in regards to this new vlog series. I've had so much fun over the past four, four weeks and I look forward to continuing this project with you. 
Um, thank you for understanding that while it was super fun to do it on a daily basis, uh, right now I have a lot on my plate. So I appreciate your, your wonderful feedback and support on that. Speaking of, oh my goodness, I'm so nervous. I got an email from the prefecture today and because of the nature of my visa, I, even though there's a lot of the process online right now and they've moved it all online for you to renew your visa for my type, I have to go in in person. Uh. <laughs> so I've got that little fun thing to look forward to. They're going to send me an appointment. So keep your fingers crossed for me, darlings. Rightly so, Pearl is watching this tractor. I think he's spreading manure, so we need to get past them pretty quickly. So let's talk real quick about this question of, do you need a car? outside what do you think Pearl do you need a car when you live outside the big cities in France uh, and the question also was especially with a dog the dog aspect of it doesn't necessarily matter in my response but let me give you an example that might make you think twice about what I'm about to say and I certainly don't mean to sound like super catastrophic and like dramatic but both of these situations have happened to me. Um, think about it, not necessarily from the daily standpoint of going for walks with your dog or just anything that you might use a car for. I want you to think about it from an urgent standpoint, okay? In the case of like Pearl, of course, I didn't know she was allergic to bees until she actually got stung for the first time. Um, if I had needed to call a taxi, in order to get to an urgent vet, she would not still be here. Okay? <laughs> That's just one perspective. Another one is, what about if something happens to you or a loved one and you urgently need to get, you know, it's not an ambulance situation, but you need to get to urgent care. Again, this has happened to me. <laughs> and thank God I had a car. Um, and... It's just a consideration, right? And I'm not talking about where I'm at right now, which is hyper rural. I didn't always live in a hyper rural place, but still this applies to it. This also goes back to <laughs> this idea of romanticizing this country, these falsehoods and false stories. And so let me explain that through the context of my experience when I first moved to this country. So when I first moved to France, I lived in Burgundy and Bonn. Bonn is not a small town, you know, it's a very decent sized town. It has a great hospital. It has all of this major services you could ask for. Train station, buses, the whole works. But I, I just still had a very antiquated false story in my head that I could live out that sort of fake dream of just wandering the markets every day. Really, Shannon? <laughs> no, of course not. That doesn't work, right? Uh, you can't literally, you can't load up an entire week, week's worth of groceries, let alone even a couple of days into a granny trolley. What if you just need basics like toilet paper and laundry detergent? Of course, you know, we've talked about this before with the French farmer's market, right? But what I'm getting at is that you slowly start coming to this realization of the logistics of daily living without a car, right? So then what did I do? I, I decided that I was going to get a bike. I got a really cute electric bike and I was like, okay, this is it. I've got my little packs on the back. I'm going to, again with this really cute French story, I'm going to have this really super sweet bike and I'm going to bike around Bone the village. I'm going to go to the nearby wine villages, go wine tasting. I can bike up to the supermarket now and I can put, you know, I can get more groceries and, and supplies that way. You know, I thought that I could like, load up my bike with you know all these supplies in these tiny you know in these 
bike packs. That, of course, was silly. It was ridiculous. Um, you know, you're not doing that in the rain. You don't have the time to go all the way outside of town. It, here, let me explain that. All right, so if you are following along on my vlog, you likely have been to France, okay? And I want you to think about kind of a medium-sized village or town that you've been in, uh, not a city, all right? I'm not talking about Paris or Lyon or Marseille or those places, Bordeaux. I'm talking about just a cute town that you've been in, like Dinan, um, maybe down Provence. I want you to think about when you've walked those streets, what's missing, right? What's missing is bigger complexes like hospitals. What's missing are your bigger supermarches, right? You may not have even thought about it, but there's like all those little convenience stores, but convenience costs money, right? Those aren't the cheap places that you go to shop for every day. Those are the places that you just stop in for the thing that you forgot. But when you were in these places, maybe for a week or two or longer, you went to the bigger supermarket on the outside of town. Large commercial districts and large commercial spaces like those are not in those older, you know, the within the confines of those older towns because there's physically no architecture and structure for them to be in. So, in almost every town in France, you have like the boulangerie, the fromage, the butcher, smaller like convenience stores for those things that you might have forgotten, but you pay for those things, right? So that's that sort of mentality, right? I tried to circumvent that system by getting an electric bike, but that still created its own problems, not just... <laughs> Not just with the bike itself, which was a steel frame. It was too heavy for me to carry up to my apartment. I had to lock it on the street side. It then got tagged. People tried to steal it. But then also, it just was not convenient. Like, I couldn't load up enough stuff to get enough supplies for, like, a couple of weeks. It was a frequency. And then became a thing, right? So then what did I do? I made another mistake. I tried another workaround. I tried renting cars. Not only am I good at making these mistakes, but clearly I'm racking up the money right now. Seriously, think about this though, from an investment standpoint, you come over here as an expat or immigrant and you're trying to do this on a fixed income or fixed budget. Start adding up what I've just been sharing with you, okay? So far, I have I have purchased an electric bike, which isn't cheap, right? Now I'm renting cars. But still, there's a the problem of even getting there because, again, car rentals are on the outskirts, right? They're on the outskirts of town where they have the space and the parking for that. So then I had to ride my bike to Europe car on the outskirts of Bone and rent a car. Then you have to put deposits down for said car. You have your daily rental fee. And then if I wanted to keep it overnight for using a couple of times, then uh, I had to find parking for it. I mean, seriously, but I was just so determined to try and, and live that false story in my head that I could be that whimsical person living in her life out in a French village somewhere and, you know, not needing that. So I tried, <laughs> I did it and it was... It was fine for, but everything felt planned. There was nothing spontaneous. I couldn't just jump in a car and go someplace. And the associated fees with it, the deposits, it just became <laughs> sort of impractical, expensive, annoying, all of the things. I then also came across this an interesting challenge in hard truth that the few friends that I had made at this point our friendship was being negatively impacted because I didn't have a mode of transportation. They didn't live right in Bone, it was super close by, like a you know, five, 10 minute car ride to their house. Uh, Christine's house was more like 15 minutes by car, but I couldn't get to them easily. And so anytime they wanted to do something with me, they had to come, 
into town and pick me up. One of the things I love to show you is like uh, being greniers and antiquing. And uh, they would graciously come and pick me up and take me out. We would have really fun days out on, you know, at nearby villages. And, you know, they put all my stuff in their car, take me back home. And, but I always kind of felt a bit guilty about that. Again, though, it wasn't really enough for me to go through the uh, process of purchasing a car in France. And it wasn't until a heat wave was happening in Bonn and a girlfriend and I went on a little trip that I kind of realized that I was at a crossroad. So at this point, I'm sure you can kind of see how frustrating this process had been for me because it wasn't just the daily stuff of just like, you know, running errands and shopping. The extra time and complications by not having proper transportation for that. And that's just me. You know, some people don't mind those sorts of things. But it was, it was difficult for me because it was just one more thing that I had to deal with on my own. But then there was like also, I swear to you, they had it like there was this delivery person at my place in Bone. She absolutely had it in for me, um, regardless of if I was actually at home waiting for my package to arrive or not. She would literally schlep it halfway across Bone to a different depot and drop it off. Some days I had to like bounce around to multiple locations to pick things up. And, you know, I showed up in this country with a single suitcase of clothes. So I had to create a whole new life here. And part of that was renovating the apartment that I had just moved into. And, you know, when you have to buy a lot of like <laughs> paper towel holders and forks and spoons, like you're not running around doing that stuff on a bike, you know? Thank you, Amazon, for helping out with those sorts of things, you know? You know? <laughs> so back to my story, um, my girlfriend and I are sitting in a sushi shop in Boone because it was one of the few affordable places at the time that had air conditioning. And she was looking at her weather app and she's kind of like popped up. She's like, you want to go on a road trip and get out of this heat? I was like, okay. She's like, yeah. Let's go up to Chamonix. It's way cooler up there. We'll go and hang up there for a couple nights. We'll split the hotel room and the tolls on the way up. I was like, uh, yeah, let's go do this. And during that three hour car ride, at one point she used the opportunity to give me a little bit of a gut check. And I'm glad that she did because the way that she framed it was really important to me and it stuck clearly. She said that, Shannon, you move halfway around the world to just stay in one place. She's like, it, Bone isn't just your home now. All of France is your home and you need to go and explore it. Right? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm being a bad friend. I'm creating complications for myself. I am trying to desperately do all these workarounds that are costing me more time, more money. In all reality, like, I just needed to just bite the bullet and buy a car. Now, here's the other kicker though, like, <laughs> as an American, we don't have the opportunity to just run down to the bank and get a lease and or a mortgage. Uh, the majority of us have to pay for these things in cash. So I'm lucky, very, very blessed, very lucky that we had the means to pay cash for a car, but that was a big decision and clearly a very big unexpected expense, not just to buy the car, but all the associated costs in just from daily stuff to the insurance to the annual maintenance and parking. Let's talk about that. So <laughs> my first big French meltdown in this country was over buying my first car here. And I, that was really, really challenging for me. Um, but it happened. And uh, I'm so glad 
that I finally made that decision because it opened up a completely different world for me. I mean, I even, <laughs> one of my first longest road trips was to go up to here to Brittany to get Pearl. Um, having a car has undoubtedly been a game changer for me in so many ways, my business, my life. Um, and again, even emergencies. So we've talked a few times about that French romanticism, those falsehood stories. And yet again, the car actually popped yet another bubble <laughs> in regards to living in a, in a town like that. And part of it was because just the logistics of owning a car in the middle of that town was sort of miserable. <laughs> Um, let me explain about that. If you've made it this far, thank you. <laughs> I know this is a long diatribe, but I think it's sort of an important one to uh, explain the reality. So that's the whole point of this vlog is to share what it's really like and also my past experiences. Um, when I did get the car, the first challenge was obviously to figure out parking. And in Boone, there was like... As a resident, I could sign up for like uh, quarterly payments that were really cheaper, but it's still like public. What is going on with this? Ugh, there we go. Um, I still had to, it was like first come first serve parking. So then I realized, well, this on the weekends when everybody shows up, everybody piles into Bone because it's an international destination. I didn't even want to take my car out because I couldn't find parking when I came back. Um, and then like the mayor had it in for me, like the, the parking attendant. Every time that I would put the car out in front of the apartment, put the flashers on to unload, they would give me a ticket. <laughs> and there was like no parking directly around my apartment. The logistics of owning a car in a town was sort of frustrating although I put up with it for quite a while. What then happened basically is this. It was sort of this conversation that I had with myself. It's like, either you be in a big city with all the benefits and services and deliveries and culture and art and museums and endless events and restaurants, or you be out in the countryside. But that middle in between for me was just making me sort of miserable and unhappy so uh, <laughs> and long story short obviously I chose a much more rural balance to uh, my city life but <laughs> I couldn't do this without a car either <laughs> it's a long-winded story huh uh, in brief let's wrap this up by explaining why some people choose to not buy a car in France. What are some reasons for that? Uh, one, um, you're afraid of driving in this country. It is intimidating. There's a lot to learn. Two, you come as an example from the US, from a state that does not have a reciprocal license agreement. <laughs> what is that? It's a hot subject. So not every state in the United States uh, signed a reciprocal agreement with France where you, within the first year, so that's the other thing, it's people that don't <laughs> do this within the first year of moving to France uh, come across this problem as well. But within the first year, you have to turn in your American driver's license in exchange for a French one, but only if you came from this a state that has a reciprocal agreement and you've been, you have had that driver's license from that reciprocal state for more than six months before you moved here. There's a, of course, all sorts of other fun things like you have to have your driver's license uh, history translated, all this sorts of paperwork. It takes a long time to receive your French driver's license in exchange. And again, some people don't necessarily want to give up their US driver's license in exchange for the French one. If you wait too long to start that process, so your first year of being here has passed, or 
you don't come from a reciprocal state, then you have to pretend that you're 15 and 16 years old again and start the whole process all over, but in France. <laughs> so you have to study, you have to take the practical, you have to do driving hours, and then you have to do the driving test, all in French. And it's expensive. I'd say on average between 1,100 to 1,500 euros. And it takes a long time. <laughs> Usually what I see is between three and six months. So those are just some reasons why people choose not to have a car in this country. And then of course there's all the associated costs of having a car here, including fun things that you don't know about like control techniques, which is something that has to be done on your car every two years and it's not cheap. Much like going through the immigration process in this country, uh, getting your carte vitale, uh, renewing your visa at the prefecture, owning and purchasing a car in this country is yet another one of those challenges and rites of passage. So I hope that you found this to be of interest to you and uh, perhaps helpful with your journey. And Speaking of, I have friends coming over tomorrow for a little coffee and coffee cake, maybe pound cake. I've got to go into town, get some of those supplies and some fresh flowers. So I hope you have a beautiful weekend ahead and maybe I'll see you tomorrow. Who knows? Bisous.